There we go, there we go. My camp's nearly complete. It just feels like it's missing, uh, something. Nope, okay, definitely not that. Not, not missing, that can go. Ladies, gentlemen, and hunters of all ages, the Wild Hearts finally releasing to the public. I'm sure most of you are diving in, getting used to the way that the game feels, enjoying the kimono hunts and all of that, but there's a specific mechanic in Wild Hearts that has a ton of depth and may be completely overwhelming at first as a result. But it's also one that you probably shouldn't ignore. Dragon Karakuri. These are the Karakuri that rebuild even when destroyed. You could consider them pieces of your camp or connected parts of your map as a whole. There are a total of 36 different Dragon Karakuri in the game, and as you start to get them, the whole system can be incredibly daunting. So let's break it down, talk about what each of them is, how to get more resources to let you place more of them, and which ones you want to focus on with your limited space, as well as a little introductory guide as to how you want to set up your camp properly as a general principle across the game as a whole. First up, to talk about this properly, we need to talk about the Dragon Pit nodes across every map. These show up by default on your map so you know where they are, even if you haven't found them in the wild. Once you have walked up to them and upgraded them the first time, you can do further upgrades from your map screen itself so you don't actually have to run around to each of them. Every Dragon Karakuri costs a certain resource, either wood, fire, water, wind, or earth. Every Dragon Pit node is tied to one or two of these resources based on its location. As you can see, when upgrading a Dragon Pit, it will raise your maximum resource points for either one or two of the types available. As a result, depending on what you want to build, pay attention to this to know what you need to upgrade. With that out of the way, let's talk about the Dragon Karakuri in general. I've split them up into six categories to make it a little bit easier to understand as a whole what is available and what general functions that they have. Some fit a little bit into multiple categories, but I've considered their main uses here. First up, let's talk traversal. I wanna go fast! The very first of these is unlocked by default, and it's the tent. This costs 50 earth resources for each extra one that you put up, and it is uniquely the only Dragon Karakuri that exists that costs this resource, only one that costs earth. This is them attempting to directly limit how many fast travel locations you have on each map, but also making sure that you don't have to worry about choosing between fast travel or other choices. For every 50 earth resources you have, you can set up a tent. That one is that simple. My general recommendation for tents is to of course spread them out around the map so you can get anywhere quicker, but also to try and put them near ancient tree wells. These wells give you 10 healing water every time you use them as well as a full heal, so it's a great place to be able to fast travel if you need to. Then we have the flying vine, which costs 15 wood each. This is a sort of ballista that you fire a shot from into a bit of terrain, it will set up a zip line that you can ride either direction. This is a super speedy and simple way to travel up cliffside specifically that would otherwise take quite a bit of climbing, and it can make your movement from one zone to another zone really efficient once you have a few of these set up. After that is the wind vortex, which costs 10 wind each, and this shoots you high up in a vertical line above it. It has some limited use in very specific locations, but it's cheap and it's just fun, honestly. After that is the enhanced flying vine, which is unlocked by killing a specific monster in Fuyu Fusagi Fort in Chapter 2. This is the quest name here, but I won't show anything else to avoid spoilers about it. This Dragon Karakuri costs 20 water resources, it works the same way as the regular Flying Vine, except that when you shoot a monster with it, it can do up to 100 damage to a properly weak spot. This isn't a lot of damage deep into the game, and the time to fire and repeat is just sort of too long to make this a viable choice of weapon, but it is a fun alternate use of this, and because it costs a different resource, it allows you to manage your camps a little bit differently. Then finally for this category is the Dragon Roll. The General Grievous style wheel bike that you've seen in trailers. This bad boy costs 40 fire resources, which is quite hefty, and the result is quite simply a vehicle that you can ride in full stop. It starts off a bit slow, but there are upgrades for the speed, and once fully upgraded, it is a genuinely good method of getting around. As well, it can damage kimono if you crash it into them, which is hilarious. Our second category today is hunt speed and general hunter power, as I know that is a main thing that a lot of people will care about. First up is the radar tower, which costs 15 water each. Each. When you interact with the radar tower, it sends a pulse out within this range that searches for a kimono in the area. When you look at your map, you can see circles representing your radar zones, and interacting with any of your radars on a map will activate all of them. Later on, you can get an upgrade for this that both increases the range, but also makes it reveal the locations of Sukumo and also some collectibles. These are an essential part of your map, the radars are, and you want to set up a network of these so that if you interact with one of them, you can essentially see the entire map without issue. It just makes life easier if you do so, and it speeds up 
every single quest you do if you know where the kimono are from the get-go. Then we have the launcher. This dragon karakuri costs 10 fire resources and has no purpose other than launching things towards a kimono that you're in combat with. If you stand on top of it, it will launch you, or you can go behind it and load it with boxes or torches, thread, stakes, whatever basic karakuri that you feel like, and it will automatically launch one of them every few seconds at a kimono within its range, dealing anywhere from 20 to 115 damage, depending on what you've put in it. It's not bad early on, but its damage compared to a hunter's definitely falls off very quickly and to get further into the game, especially when you have better uses for your thread. Then the final one for this category is the Celestial Sukumo Camp. This costs 30 wood resources and makes a little shrine. After a fair bit of time, the 0 out of 1 will turn into 1 out of 1. And what this does is when you interact with it, is essentially give you the same effect as Hunter's Arm. It essentially just doubles your thread maximum, and it also gives you a ton of thread. As you can see here in this clip, I've started up with 42 thread before I've even started a hunt of any kind. This is obviously useful as it means you can start the very beginning of a hunt with 42 or even more thread, which is an insane amount to do an opener with. It lets you do some silly things like placing three cannons down before the kimono even knows that you exist. Who would do that? Then we come to the gathering section of Dragon Karakuri. Some of these will automate the process of gathering certain things from the maps and save you loads of time as a result. Others actually generate materials that you can't get from anywhere else. First up, we have the Paddle Scoop for 30 water resources, and this will slowly gather fish for you up to a maximum of nine before needing to be emptied. This one's quite good. However, unless your preferred food type in this game is fish, I'd be hesitant to use it in the early game, given that the resource category that it's in competes with the radars, which again, are genuinely very important to have a lot of until your network is complete. After that is the Sukumo or Shrine. This makes a shrine that just looks like the Celestial Camp as well, which is aesthetically quite nice as you can put them next to each other and it just looks nice and uniform. This simply generates ore over time. Specifically, it will generate the ore from the map itself, any of the types of ore that you can get on that map. If you put this on the spring map, it will give you the ore found on the spring map. If you put it on the winter map, it will generate the ore found on the winter map, so on and so forth. Interestingly, you can put these in Minato itself, and when put there, they will exclusively generate core stone and nothing else. These are extremely useful though, as upgrading weapons in this game tends to require a lot of ore, especially once you start heading into your endgame weapons. So spending a load of resources on these shrines will pay dividends in the long run. Then we have the Wildlife Cage, which costs 30 wind resources. There is a system in the game that lets you pick up little creatures if you are fast enough when you run past them, and this cage lets you display some of the creatures and keep them as pets. This also results in unique rewards, as a cage Occasionally they will drop a material in the cage, and these materials you simply cannot get from anywhere else in the game. After that is the Sukumo Food Shrine for 30 resources, and this one is decent but not fantastic. It generates food resources from whatever map it is on up to 9 at a time, specifically vegetables, but you just can't get meat from this. Considering meat is the food type in the game that gives you attack boost, most people will want meat over the other kinds, and this thing simply cannot provide meat. Still great for vegetables though. Finally in this category is the Wild Wildlife Pen, which costs 30 water a piece. Again, these are related to the creature system. There are just some creatures that can't be put in the cage and need to be put in the pen. Simple as that. Otherwise, the reasons to do this are exactly the same. Unique rewards and just the fun of displaying certain pets if you like that. Moving on then to our next section, which I have labeled Processing. Quite simply, all of our next ones relate to the food system. They in some way are used to make the raw ingredients that you find more potent, more powerful, and more efficient to use. This system is extremely deep, and we have a full guide about the food system system as a whole coming up on the channel very soon, so I won't delve into it too deeply here, but I will explain the basics of what each of these karakuri are and what they can do. First up is the drying rack for 30 fire resources. Using this, you put multiple of one ingredient in, and after a bit of time, you will receive the dried version of it. This comes in a smaller amount, but tends to have more potent results when using it and is worth using for that reason. After that is the ingredients chest for 30 wind resources. This simply lets you store extra ingredients as the pouch that your hunter has on them has very limited space for this. After that is the pickling jar for 30 water. Pickling ingredients lets you combine food and seasoning ingredients together to increase the amount of skills the food will give you. Then we have the fermenting cask for 30 fire resources. This lets you create seasonings in general for use with the pickling jar. After that is the communal ingredients chest, which is accessible by other hunters and multiplayer, and also costs 30 wood resource rather than 30 wind of the normal one. After that is the smoker for 30 wood resources, and this is the one that enhances enhances the skills on the food to make them properly stronger. To really simplify it, the strongest that you can make an ingredient is to dry it, then pickle it, then put it in the smoker for a finish. Again, a proper guide on the system will be on the channel very soon. After this, we have the Vermilion Fermenting Cast, which is the same
same thing as regular, but aesthetically a different color and cost 30 water resource instead of 30 fire. The vermilion pickling jar, which again is only an aesthetic difference aside from costing 30 wind instead of 30 water. And the vermilion smoker, which once again is purely aesthetic difference aside from costing 30 fire instead of 30 wood resource. And with that, let's move on to our second to last category, aesthetic. These are the dragon karakuri that have no purpose other than being, you know, there. They are purely aesthetic options, allowing you to liven up the place and make it feel like a proper home. I worked so hard to make this house into a home. They serve no mechanical function, they're just there to look nice and spruce up the joint. These include the sign for five wind, the ornamental lantern for five fire, the wind chime for five wind, the small desk for five wind, the bench for five water, the sunshade for five wind, the bathtub for five fire, the vermilion wind chime for five wood, and the tanuki statue for five wood, as well as the ornamental gateway for ten wind. Then finally, our last category is for somewhat miscellaneous items. First up here is the basic campfire. This does let you join multiplayer sessions with others and also upgrade your Tsukumo. It has no other purpose, and you can do both of these things from Minato in your home once you've reached it, so realistically on an actual map, all it does is eat up ten fire resources. After that is the forge. This lets you create and change equipment on the go. It costs 15 water resources, and my personal recommendation is to just create one when you need it, then destroy it when you're done. It has no real use to being a constant staple on your map, and is much more useful to save the resources to be able to spawn it literally anywhere that you feel like it at any given time. Then we have the training bear for 10 fire resources. This is literally just a copy of the training bear that already exists in Minato. There isn't much use for this on a map unless you want to double check something real quick, but again I wouldn't recommend keeping this up on a map as it just takes up resources without proper gain. Then finally of all the dragon karakuri is the looking glass for 15 water resources. This quite simply lets you edit your character's appearance and name. It brings you back to the character creator to mess with whatever you'd like there. I'd recommend having one of these around Venato, but there is no reason to have one on actual maps unless you just really like changing it up frequently, like for every hunt. With all that covered then, let's talk a bit about how you want to set up both your camps and your Minato itself in terms of which Dragon Karakuri will actually benefit you both in the short and long term. First up, let's talk about Minato itself, the hub area. You can place Dragon Karakuri here, and this is where I'd recommend setting up all of your food processing type items, your drying racks, fermenting casts, pickling jars, smokers, all of that. You can also set up an ingredients chest on each map if you feel the need for it, but if you have a couple of them here in Minato, you should be set up nice and good. Early on, a Tsukumo or Shrine set up here isn't a bad idea either, as Core Stone is an important early resource, and they only generate Core Stone here. But eventually, you'll have more Core Stone than you know what to do with if you do this, a couple of flying vines in the area is not a bad idea at all. There are fast travels from the map to get to all of the important locations here, but at the very least I'd recommend this one that gets you from the loading in point to the forge, so you can just do that travel faster than a loading screen. It just saves you a lot of time over the course of your journey, and that's the main travel that you'll be doing in town. Other than that, you want to set up your wildlife cages and pens here as well, as they don't have any benefit from being on a map specifically, and this lets you both look at your little guides and gives you a nice central location to collect the resources that they drop. Aside from that, Minato can be a location for purely aesthetic dragon karakuri using the rest of your resources if you want. Stick them all here wherever you want, make the place look nice. It's not a bad idea to put a looking glass here somewhere so you can change up your character aesthetics in your home base as well. With that said, let's move on to the actual map base setup. You'll want to choose one tent to make your main base on each map. Generally this is going to be wherever you have a tent that has the most space around it, whether that is the original tent that you get on the map for free or another place that you happen to prefer, that's up to you. At this main base, you want to set up a load of ore shrines as early as possible in the game to just start building up your ore collections, a food shrine or two to help build up your ingredient collection, and at least one celestial Tsukumo camp on each map so you can get that free hunter's arm on every single one of them. This may look weird, but this is an ideal resource generation farm for a map. Just a ton of these shrines of different functions that make it so you should never have to go around picking up ore manually ever again. Aside from that, as I mentioned earlier, you want radars, definitely one at your main base so you can activate all of them from there, otherwise place them around the map to make a nice net of vision that lets you see everywhere at once. I'd also recommend a dragon roller at your main camp. This won't always be the closest to your target, but when it is, this will be a nice speed increase, and it costs too much to just say have one at every camp. You could argue that this is one that you could simply destroy and then remake from wherever you actually start your hunt, but that choice is up to you. Past that, unrelated to the camps, you want to use flying vines to help you set up your routes to various other zones faster than simply walking there would be. Simply fill up your map with these as much as your spare resources will allow, and it will make your movement significantly easier, especially when going places vertically out of reach. Aside from this, everything else is personal choice.
choice. You can choose to set up some aesthetic items, you can choose to put up a wind vortex somewhere if you want, though generally flying vines are more effective, and you can also set up paddle scoops if you particularly like the fish-based food specifically. But again, those are quite expensive, and fish is only there if you prefer stamina-based boosts. And that's everything you need to know everyone. All of the 36 dragon karakuri that you unlock, either through progress or simply by spending points on them in the karakuri upgrade tree, as well as some good practices for placing the general dragon karakuri around the map, what should go where, and what is just for fun personal decorations. I hope you've learned some useful stuff from this and just had fun checking out what all the options are. Like if you liked the video, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye